In the previous lesson, we considered two of those subsections. We looked at the translation of the Old Testament out of the Hebrew into Greek, or the LXX or the Septuagint. We had a long conversation about that last Sunday. And the second section we looked at last week was translation out of Hebrew and Greek into Latin. Today we want to finish our investigation of the translation subsections by considering the following. We want to look at, number one, the translation of the scriptures into the vulgar tongues. And number two, the unwillingness of our chief adversaries that the scriptures should be divulged into mother tongues, etc. So we're we'll going to be looking at those two this morning. Um, so we've been working off this format, guys, where I've presented to you a modern spelling transcription on the left, and then the modern form edited by Rose and Lupus on the right. And we've been starting each, uh, each conversation by reading the modern form first, and then talking about what Smith was getting at. You guys all know, hopefully, that when I say Smith, I'm referring to Miles Smith. Miles Smith is the author of the preface to the 1611. And so what we're doing now is we've been now in, a, in, a, in for quite a number of weeks looking at the 1611 as a historical artifact. We looked at all the preliminary material. Now we're dissecting the preface. The reason we're spending so much time on this is because the preface is often misrepresented and misconstrued by people on both sides of the translational version debate. People that are pro King James as well as people who are pro modern version will often in my opinion, uh, seek to leverage the preface in certain ways to try to prove their side of the case against their opponents. I feel both sides do this, and so I feel we need to get a good understanding or a proper perspective of the preface, which is why I've translated this. You guys know Nate Kuinger, right? He had to comment to me that I have about my alliteration in the titles. Proper producing a proper perspective of the preface, that's intentional okay I'm doing that on purpose but anyway so uh, again just a brief I've been saying this at the beginning of every one of these lessons just for the benefit of anybody who might be watching the thing the resource that you're going to want to pick up if you want to really study this for yourself is the translators to the reader the original preface to the King James version of 1611 revisited and this is the one from 1997 edited by Rhodes and Lupus that presents the preface in three different formats. So you're definitely gonna to wanna to check that out if you are interested in going through this yourself. You don't need to because I've presented it to you here, but you know, if you're like me, you're gonna to wanna to get your own copy of it. So let's get into our first subsection today, which is the translation of the scripture into the vulgar tongues. So to follow our procedure, we're gonna be reading the modern form first, edited by Rhodes and Lupus on the right, and this is paragraph nine of the preface. So let's look at what this says. <clears throat> it says, the church had already been supplied with Greek and Latin translations even before the faith of Christ was generally accepted in the empire. For scholars know that even in St. Jerome's time, the council of Rome and his wife were both pagan, as also the majority of the senate. Yet even so, goodly scholars were not satisfied merely with having the scriptures in the languages which they themselves understood, Greek and Latin, but, uh, I'm sorry, just as good uh, lepers are not satisfied with being healed themselves, but told their neighbors about the gift that God had sent so that they might also provide for themselves. Therefore, they made translations into the native languages of their countrymen for the benefit and enlightenment of those who hungered and thirsted after righteousness and who also had souls to be saved. Consequently, most nations under heaven shortly after their conversion heard Christ speaking to them in their own languages, not just by the voice of their minister, but also by the translated written word. And uh, if anyone doubts this, there is more than adequate evidence if proof is required. To begin with, St. Jerome says, quote, the scriptures translated earlier in the languages of many nations show that those things which were added by, uh, then he's, he mentions in parentheses or brackets, uh, Lucian and uh, Hesius are false. The same Jerome also, uh, uh, same, sorry, the same Jerome elsewhere affirms that earlier he had made a translation from the Septuagint uh, for his countrymen of Dalmatia, Erasmus understands these words to mean that St. Jerome translated the scriptures into the Dalmatian language, 
while Sisto da Senia and El, uh, El Franco de uh, Castro, to mention only two, men not only objected to by those of Rome, also frankly admitted as much, St. Chris, Chrysostom, who lived in St. Jerome's time, agrees with him. The teachings of St. John did not vanish away like the philosopher's teachings, but the Syrians, Egyptians, Indians, Persians, Ethiopians, and numerous other nations being barbarous people translated it into their languages and have learned to be true philosophers, i.e. Christians. So what, he's, what Smith is getting at there is, is their early testimony that the scriptures were translated into the vernacular languages of the people of both Europe and North Africa. Okay. Uh, to these may be added evidence that uh, the, uh, Theodoret. Theodoret, I guess, uh, as the next, both from antiquity and learning, his words are, quote, every country under the sun is full of these words, of the apostles and prophets and the Hebrew language, i.e. the scriptures in the Hebrew tongue, is turned not only into the language of the Greeks, but also of the Romans and Egyptians and Persians and Indians and Armenians and Scythians and um, Samaritans, Soromantians, and briefly into the languages used by any nation. Similarly, Ulfius is reported by Paulus uh, Diaconus and Isidore, and before them by uh, Sozaman, 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 whatever, to have translated the scriptures into the Gothic language. John, Bishop of Seville, is said by Vassius to have translated them into Arabic about A.D. 717. Bede is said by Hygen, is that right? Hygen, Hygen, whatever, to have translated a great part of them into Saxon. Einhardt is said by uh, Trementius to have abridged the French Psalter as Bede had done to the Hebrew about the year 800. King Alfred is, is said by Hagen to have translated, or Hygen, whatever, to have translated the Psalter into Saxon. Uh, Methodius is said by, I love these names, right? Okay. <laughs> Advantius to have translated the scriptures into Slovakian about A.D. 900. Waldo, Bishop of Fresian, is said by uh, Betus um, Renanus. Renanus to have commissioned about that time a metrical translation of the Gospels into German, which is still extant in the library of Corbonian. Veldes is said to is said by several to have translated them himself or to have had them translated into French about the year 1160. Charles V, called the Wise, had them translated into French about 200 years after the time of uh, Veldes, many copies of which are still extant as um, Bearer, Berelotus, sure, uh, attests at, the, uh, at that time, even in the days of King Richard III, John Trevisia translated them into English, and many manuscript copies of English Bibles, most probably translated in this period, may still be seen in various places. The Syriac translation of the New Testament in um, Widmanstadt's Whitman edition is in most scholars' libraries, and many copies of the Psalter in Arabic, in addition to the August, Augustinius uh, Nebensius postal affirms uh, in his travels, he saw the Gospels in the Ethiopian language, and Ambrose Theus, uh, Theus uh, vouches for the Indian Psalter, which he claims to have been published by Poltekin in Syrian characters. So that, having the scriptures in one's own language, is not an uh, quaint. a quaint idea recently thought up, whether by Lord Cromwell in England or by Lord Radville in Poland or by Lord. <laughs> That's a tough one. Well, you got you I guess, in uh, the Emperor's dominion. But it has been thought about and put into practice from antiquity even from the earliest days of the conversion of any nation 
probably because it was thought to best encourage faith to grow men's hearts the sooner and to enable them to say with the words of the psalm we had heard about it and we had, sorry and now we have seen it so that's a mouthful okay there's all these foreign names in there and this and that but the paragraph is about the translation of the scriptures into the vulgar or the vernacular tongues okay now let's look at page three underneath that and we'll start at the first bullet point the english word vulgar now when you hear the word vulgar today you think of what obscene. something that's profane obscene bad language you know somebody using vulgarity that kind of a thing right the english word vulgar occurs twice in subsection eight once in the title, quote, the translating of the scripture into the vulgar tongues, and a second time in the body of, the par in the body of paragraph 9, quote, they provided translations into the vulgar for their countrymen. Most people in the 21st century think of swearing or profanity when the word vulgar is used in a modern context. Therefore, it is important that we understand that the word vulgar, what the word vulgar meant in the early 17th century when Smith penned the preface. Bottom of page 3. Robert Coundry's A Table Alphabetical, published in 1604, contains the following entry for the word vulgar. Quote, common or much used. Okay, common or much used. Likewise, the Oxford English Dictionary contains the following entry for the noun form of the word vulgar. Number one, quote, the common or unusual language of a country, the vernacular, obsolete. Next, OED provides a citation from subsection 8, paragraph 9 of Miles Smith's preface from 1611 as a word usage example of, of this form of vulgar. See the following image. So if you go to the top page 4, here's the image screenshot I took from the OED website. Okay, And notice, here's the definition, the common or unusual language of a country, the vernacular, it's marked obsolete. Okay. You come down here to 1611, and one of the word uses examples that the OED provides for this definition is coming from the King James Bible, and it's from the paragraph that we're talking about, and it's this statement right here. For, uh, for it behooved the edifying of the unlearned that they provided translations into the vulgar. Okay, So vulgar, by definition at the time, is not referring to profanity, swearing, cussing, obs obscenity, it's referring to common vernacular, something that's in common usage, okay? So if you look at the bullet point underneath the screenshot, therefore when Smith talks about, quote, vulgar tongues, he is speaking about the vernacular or the common language of a given area. For example, the vulgar tongue of Germany is German. That makes sense, right? So what's the vulgar tongue of France? French. What's the vulgar tongue of Italy? Italian. Italian. We could go on and on, right? Now, in America, we speak English, but the British would say we speak American English. If you go to Britain, do they speak English, but a slightly different form of English? The King's English. The King's English, right? Do they spell words differently than we do here in the United States? They do, all right? Um, you know, just look at the word donut. How do you spell the word donut? D-O-N-U-T, right? If you spell it over there, you spell it D, I, I figured this out, D-O-U-G-H-N-U-T, donut. Still referring to what? Same the same thing, same language, different vernacular. Okay? Even in America, can you have dialects of English? If you go down south, they speak English, but do they have a slightly different... Hey, yeah, they, there's certain regional usages, even in the United States, of English, right? So when Miles Smith is referring to the vulgar tongue, he's referring to the common languages of the different people groups. So if you are in Africa, if you're in Ethiopia, it would be Ethiopian. You, you get the point, okay? So the, look at the next bullet. The point of this subsection is to address the necessity of translating God's word into the vulgar or common tongues of the people. In the first sentences of the paragraph, Smith discusses how the translation of God's word into, quote, vulgar tongues 
was a concern of the body of Christ from early in church history. Quote, now through the church was this uh, was thus furnished with Greek and Latin translations even before the faith of Christ was generally accepted in the empire. For the learned know how even in St. Jerome's time, the council of Rome and his wife were both uh, ethnics and about the same time, the greatest part of the Senate also. Yet for all that the goodly learned were not content to have the scriptures in the language which they themselves understood, Greek and Latin, as the good lepers were not content to fare well themselves, but acquainted their neighbors with the store that God had sent, that they also might provide for themselves. But also, but also for the behoof of edifying of the unlearned, which hungered and thirsted after righteousness, and have saved and had souls to be saved, as well as they that provided translations into the vulgar for their countrymen, insomuch that most nations under heaven did shortly after their conversion hear Christ speaking unto them in their mother tongue, not, not by the voice of their ministers only, but also by the written word translated. So in other words, did they understand that they needed to translate the word of God into the tongues of the people, the uh, into the nations, okay? Grab your Bible quick and open up to Romans 16. <clears throat> Open up to Romans 16. This is a verse that has always loomed large in my mind when it comes to the issue of translation. Romans 16, verse 25. Notice what it says. Now to him that has the power to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, now watch the next part of the verse, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, we, uh, the everlasting God made known to, what's the next two words? All, All nations for the obedience of faith. So does... Does God Almighty, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, does he want all nations to know the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery? Yes. Well, how are all nations going to know that information? They're going to know that information by that information being translated into their what? Amen. Into their languages. So the Bible, the, the Bible foresees, in a sense, that the scriptures are going to need to be what? Translated. Okay, so what Miles Smith is talking about in this paragraph is that from very early in church history, when a when the gospel penetrated into a given nation or people group and people began to be saved, one of the first things that they that they had a mind to do was to translate the scriptures into their tongue, into their vulgar tongue. Okay? Has everybody got any questions about that? In, in the old time. Yeah, it's in uh, Genesis 11. Yeah. So. God confounds the language. So, according to Genesis, just, let's just go quick. Genesis 11. Before Genesis 11, the scriptures teach that the whole world was of one language and of one speech. Okay. By the way, this is what happens in history, too, when we start to see what is called nationalist movements. Okay, so before the time of World War I, Germany was a loose confederation of undivided states until the time of Bismarck. Bismarck unified Germany. There are all these lesser German states. If you study, like, for example, the Napoleonic Wars and the Congress of Vienna that occurs after the Napoleonic Wars, where the state, the heads of the states of Europe get together and they decide what is Europe going to look like now that we've gotten rid of Napoleon. Germany at that time is a loose confederation of undivided states. What ends up happening under Bismarck is he unites them together into a unified Germany, into a modern state of Germany. The same thing happens in Greece. The same thing happens in Italy. Okay. Now, one of the main one of the main movers and shakers of these unification movements in modern nationalism is the idea of language, okay? 
So these people that share a common language, culture, history, and tradition, they start looking around and they're like, why are we united into a hundred different principalities? Why are we divided, excuse me, into a hundred different principalities? We should all do what? Yeah. Unite together. And by the way, once Germany unites, is that a pretty important thing in terms of world history? When you think about World War I and World War II, a unified Germany is going to be highly consequential in many ways to world history. But anyway, look at Genesis 11, 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So before Babel, did all, they only spoke one language, according to what the Word of God says. Now watch. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name. Now here's why they're doing it. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So my Sunday school teacher, when I was a kid, said, that they, God didn't like it because they were building a tower to try to reach him by their own effort. Okay? That is not what the text says. Why does God become disenchanted with what they're doing? Because they're doing it lest they be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Is that a direct violation of what God told them to do? Go back to Genesis chapter 9. Go back to Genesis chapter 9. After, after In Genesis chapter 9, after the flood... Noah and his family come out of the, out of the other side, okay? Uh, verse, Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. And God, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and do what? Replenish, Replenish the earth. So the, the command that God gives mankind after the flood is to go out and fill what? Yeah. Fill the earth. Well, why are they behaving this way in chapter 11? Go back to chapter 11, verse 4, second half, second half of the verse. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. What they're doing here is it in direct rebellion against God. Shake your head, yes. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going on here, right? So verse Genesis 11, 5, And, God, and the Lord came down to see, to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. Now look at verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, this people is one. And they had all one language. And this they begin to do, and nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So instead of filling the earth, instead of scattering and refilling and replenishing the earth like they're instructed to do, man is congregating into one place. They all have one language. God looks at it and he says, this isn't what we wanted. This isn't what we asked them to do. And so the way you fix, one of the ways you fix it is you confound their what? Language. Look at verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and they begin, uh, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Verse 7, Go to, let us go down there, and let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not what? Understand, Understand one another's speech, right? And so ever since then, we, we, could, we studied nationalism before here in this church many times, right? God institutes a nationalistic structure where he divides men on the earth in chapter 10 and 11 of Genesis according to their tongues, their languages, their families, and their lands. That's what he does, right? Now, what we're talking about and what Miles Smith is talking about in the preface is the idea that once the, once the gospel, once the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ penetrated into a, per, into a particular region or people group, it wasn't long before that group started to want God's word in their what? In their language. Okay? Let's go back to the notes. We're on bottom of page four, right? Yeah. Okay. After the opening sentence, Smith proceeds to satisfy any doubters by providing a lengthy list of historical examples of vulgar translations. Quote, the Syrians, Egyptians, Indians, Persians, Ethiopians... And infinite other nations, being barbarous people, translated translated it into their mother tongue, and have learned to be true philosophers. He meaneth Christians. To this be added, and I'm not, I'm going to skip the names. Okay, I'm not even going to try to pronounce all these names a second time. 
uh, as next unto him, both from antiquity and from learning, his words be these. Every country that is under the sun is full of these words of the apostles and prophets. And the Hebrew tongue, he meaneth the scriptures in the Hebrew tongue, is turned not only into the language of the Grecians, but also of the Romans and the Egyptians and the Persians and Indians and Armenians and Scythians and um, Sormatians, and briefly into all the languages that any nation what? Use it. Okay, so he's being very uh, clear there about what he's saying. All right, top page five. Sorry, i got to get caught up to where I'm actually at there. Next, Smith authors, uh, offers a historical list in roughly chronological order of those who translated portions or the entirety of the scriptures into the various vulgar languages. Rather than re-quoting the entirety of this lengthy section, we have prepared a following summative list of Smith's verbose prose, okay? So number one, Ulfius, into Gothic. So I'm, I'm working off this list here. We're just going to be brief about this, okay? Number two, John, Bishop of Chrysantius, turned part of them into Saxon around 800 AD. So you will notice here, uh, what did I say? Saxon. Sorry, I, I skipped down here. Yeah. Arabic, yes. Notice, so uh, Ulfius would have been something like 350, 360. So notice, is he doing this in roughly chronological order, this list? So as Smith begins now in the preface to list off examples of people who have translated into the vulgar tongues, he's going to give a list in roughly chronological order. Okay, And there are some specific dates mentioned that, that substantiate this. Then 30 talks about Bede, who turned them into Saxon around AD, uh, 800 AD. Uh, Efnard who uh, abridged the French Psalter, so that would be a French translation of the Psalms. King Alfred, who turned the Psalter into Saxon. Um, Meth Meth uh, Methodius, Methodius turned, the, turned the scriptures into Slovenian. Valdo turned the, uh, the gospel we translate into Dutch rhythm. Now, one thing I have to check on this, I think Dutch here, he means German. Um, I, I don't think he means Dutch the way we understand Dutch today. So Deutsch. that's Deutsch. Deutsch would probably be the way to say it. I'm pretty sure that's a reference to German, not modern Dutch. Okay. Uh, Valdis have turned, have turned uh, them himself into French about the year 1160. So here's another, here's another thumbtack here on the year 1160. So you can see that he's working his way through this in roughly chronological order. As Smith is presenting this, Charles the uh, Charles the Fifth, surnamed the Wise, to have caused them to be turned into French about 200 years after Veldus, Veldus time, uh, of which translation there may be copies yet extant. Then you've got John uh, Tr Trevesia in King Richard's time. He's translating them into English. Um, Whitman Stadius is doing the Syrian translation of the New Testament. Uh, Augustantus Nebiensis <laughs> set forth the uh, Psalter into Arabic. And Postal, uh, so Postal affirmeth in his travel that the Gospels in the Ethiopian tongue and Ambrose Theus alleged the Psalter of the Indians um, which he testifieth to have been set forth by um, Potkin. Potkin in Syrian characters. So there you have a, that's a roughly chronological historical list of all of the different people throughout history who have sought to take the scriptures and put them into their vulgar tongue. All right. So <laughs> after chronicling the history of vulgar translations of scriptures, of the scriptures, Smith concludes the paragraph with the following statement regarding why the setting forth of the scriptures into the vulgar tongues was deemed important. Quote, so that to have the scriptures in the mother tongue is not a quaint conceit lately taken up either by Lord Cromwell in England or by Lord Radville in uh, Polony. I'm assuming that's Poland, but I might be wrong. 
or by Lord Ugandius in the emperor's do, uh, dominion, but hath been thought upon and put in practice of old. So let's stop there. So in other words, is this just some new English idea to put the words into the vulgar tongue? No. No. Has this been, is there a long historical tradition of doing this all over the world in a bunch of different languages? Is this point, okay? Uh, and put in practice of old, even from the first times of the conversion of any nation. So there's my point again. Shortly after the, the, the gospel penetrates into a particular nation or people group, it's not long before they want the word of God in their language, okay? No doubt because it was esteemed most profitable to cause faith to grow in men's hearts the sooner and to make them to be able to say with the words of the Psalms, quote, as we have heard, so we have seen. So in other words, they want to be able to hear it, the word preached, but they also want to be able to see it in their own one language. language. All right. Now, before we look at this last point here, has anybody got any questions? I'm just curious of the use of that barbarous peoples. What does that mean? Barbarous peoples would have been the, so at the time, a barbarian was any non-cultured person. So they were referring to half the world. So they're referring to half the world, yes. They're referring to anybody who didn't know Latin or Greek. That's what they're referring to. So anybody who spoke Gothic or Ethiopian or Syrian or whatever, whatever language was not Latin or Greek would have been considered barbarous. By the standards of the time. I'd only heard so even if you look up the yeah, even if you look up the word barbarian today, one of the definitions of it is going to be a non-classical person. Okay. I figured it must be that. Yeah. So when looking at like the, the modern translations of, of God's word in English, there's so many of them, like as far as ESV, NIV, NAS, all of them. And then looking at like this happening throughout history in these other languages, there was. I'm, I, I guess my question is, is obviously there's got to be one that's most accurate. And is that the one that we today are using as true? So, you, you, okay, so you're talking about in hi past history or right now? Well, past history, I'm just wondering like, if they had the same problem that we have right now. No, I, don't, I do not think that in past history they had the same virginal problem that we have now. So in other words, whatever the preserved manuscripts were, the people of that language group translated them into their language. And I don't think that occurred with a multiplicity of tons and tons and tons. We have, there's over like 200 plus English translations. And I, think, I don't think that was, the main issue for them was just having it in their language. So I don't think, for example, the Phoenicians or the Ethiopians are debating which Ethiopic translation is the most accurate? Mm, okay. I think they're using whatever whatever that has been provided for them to use. This whole scenario that we are involved in now is really a modern product of, of you know the Industrial Revolution and people having time to kill to do nothing else but to sort of really um, specialize in ways that people before this didn't do. Okay. okay? So even at the time of the King James translators, you have you have a it, it, you you really only you had sort of a lower class and you had sort of a, an upper middle class and you didn't really have much of what we would consider to be a middle class. If you were fortunate enough to be born into the upper class, you were educated. You went to Oxford, you went to Cambridge, you did all the stuff. If you weren't, you probably didn't really you know, you, you didn't have the same level of training, right? Yeah. And even at that time, these scholars, they have nothing else to do but sit here and read Greek. There's no internet, there's no YouTube, there's no, you know, they don't have the kinds of distractions that people have today. But I do not think that these people had the same versional debates of old in their vernacular languages that we have today in, in, uh, in English. Thank you. So, yeah, Amy, did you... Point. Um, I have not heard you bring up this John Trevisa and King Richards translated them into English. Um, you talk about Tyndale and so, all these other... 
you'll have to let me look back through the lessons, but we did talk at one point about Anglo-Saxon and the Word of God before Wycliffe, where I mentioned Bede, I mentioned at King Alfred, I mentioned, there's, the, the problem is there's not a lot to go on. We know that it happened because there's references to it happening and there's scant evidence of it happening, but we don't have the same level of understanding of it that we do with Wycliffe, Tyndall, and these other ones. But we, I did mention it. I'll just have to dig up the exact lesson where I talked about it. Anybody else? Okay, now, we, you know that as we've been doing this, we've been tracking with... By the way, I did talk in one of the lessons, too, about the idea of perpetual preservation. So is God obligated to preserve his word in every language that the body of Christ has ever used? So in other words, was there a time when there was a section of the body of Christ that was using Gothic? Yes. yes. Was the word of God available to them in their language? Yes. yes. Time, history, circumstances, no one reads or speaks Gothic anymore the way they used to, right? So once the body of Christ moves on to a different language, is God obligated to perpetually preserve his, his word in the discarded language that the body of Christ no longer is using? I would say no. And I would say that it is the, it is the element of the believing church handling the text that is one of the things that God uses to preserve his word. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. Now I talked about that in a lesson. If you want to get the, the material, I'll show you where to get it. All right, now. At the very end of paragraph 9, Smith quotes Psalm 48.8 in support of his final in the support of his final sentence of the paragraph. Okay? So let's look at the table here. So here's what it says in the preface. As we have heard, so we have seen. Here's what the A V says. As we have heard, so we have so have we seen. And here's what the Geneva says, as we have heard, so have we seen. Okay? So, the quote in the preface, is it the same as both the Geneva and the AV? Yeah. Okay? Now, I've bolded the, the Geneva column and not the AV column for a specific reason, so let's look at the explanation in the next bullet. I believe Smith to be quoting from the Geneva Bible in this verse. The Bishop's Bible that served as the base text for the AV according to Rule 1, reads as follows in the first two clauses of Psalm 48.8. Like, so not like, so it says like, as we have heard, so have we seen. Note how the King James translators altered the first clause of the bishops, like as we have heard, to read as the Geneva, as we have heard. This is yet another, another case of the translators reinstating a Geneva reading in the AV. So when they, when, they amend the, when they amend the Bishop's Bible, do they reinstate the Geneva reading into the authorized version? Now, some of you who are new, you're going to be like, what are you talking about? The rest of you, we've been over this over and over and over again as we looked at what they actually did. Okay? So I have, so in my mind, this is Smith using the Geneva reading, because they preferred the Geneva reading over what? Over the bishop's reading. All right? Now, any other questions before we move on to the last point? I definitely want to finish this today. No? Okay, so I think we have enough time. Should have enough time. The next subsection is the unwillingness of our chief adversaries that the scripture should be divulged in the mother tongues. So before we read any of this, is he going to be talking about people who were opposed to this? Okay. Now who do you think those people might be? Roman those would be the Roman Catholics. Okay. So let's look at what he says. Now, one thing I want to point out to you, it's, it's easy to miss this because we're not just sitting down and reading the whole preface straight through. But is each paragraph, each subsection building on what was said in the previous? Yes. Yes. All right. So, paragraph 10. Reading from the modern form to start with. Now, the Church of Rome would seem finally to be showing a motherly affection towards her children by allowing them to have the scriptures in their mother tongue. 
It's kind of a slam, in my opinion. Now, the Mother Church of Rome would seem finally, <laughs> he's saying, to be showing a motherly affection towards her children by allowing them to have the scriptures in their mother tongue. But while it is a gift, it is not really a gift because it is a useless gift. They must first get a license in writing before they use them. And to get that, they must demonstrate to their confessor that they are, if not uh, frozen in the dregs, at least soured with the leaven of their superstition. Did I skip something? No. But then it seemed too much to Clement VIII that there should be any license granted to have them in the common language, and therefore he overrules and frustrates the grant of Pius IV. They are so afraid of the light of the scriptures. So let's just stop there. So in other words, if you want the Bible in English, do you have to petition church authorities to allow you to have it? Yeah. So even though the Bible is in English now by the Catholic Church at this time, at least the New Testament through the Reims New Testament, they're not giving carte blanche approval to just anybody to have it and use it. Okay? They are so afraid of the light of the scriptures, as Tertullian puts it, that they will not trust the people with it, not even when it is translated into their own, not only when it is translated by their own loyal scholars, and not even with the license of their own bishops and inquisitors. They are so unwilling to open the scriptures to the people's understanding in any way that they are not ashamed to confess that we force them to translate it into English against their will. So in other words, these crazy Protestants... They're making us do this, dang nabbits, and we don't want to, <laughs> right? This seems to be uh, this seems to be agreed a bad cause. Or, uh, our, sorry, this seems to argue a bad cause or a bad conscience or both. We know that it is not the person uh, with good gold who is afraid to bring it to the touchstone, but the one that has the counterfeit. So, in other words. If you've got real gold, are you ashamed to have it weighed and tried? No. If you don't have real gold, are you ashamed to have it weighed and tried? Yes. All right. Nor is it the honest person that avoids the light, but the evil, lest his deeds be exposed. Top page seven. It is not the straightforward merchant that is unwilling to have the weights be the weights or measures examined but the one who cheats. But let us overlook this fault and return to the matter of translation. Okay? So there you have the modern rendition. Let's sort of discuss what he's getting at here. It's subsection 9, paragraph 10. Miles Smith addresses the attitude of the Roman Catholic Church toward the vernacular translations of the Word of God. While the Roman Catholic Church had technically allowed the Scriptures to be put into English by 1611, via the Douay Reims Bible, Smith is quick to point out in this subsection that the church is still restricting access to them in the mother tongue. So they've done it, it's there, but are they, have they given the, the people card block to just read it without their permission? Okay, quote, <clears throat> Now the church of Rome would seem at length to bear a motherly affection towards her children to allow them the scriptures in their mother tongue, but indeed it is, but uh, but indeed it is a gift, not deserving to be called a gift, an unprofitable gift, that they must first get a license in writing before they may before they may use them, and to get that they must approve themselves to their confessor, that is to be such as are, if not frozen in the dregs, yet soured with the leaven of their superstition. So, in other words. The Catholic Church is not just granting free access to the mother tongue, the Bible in the mother tongue. Okay? After pointing out how various popes have contradicted themselves on the matter of granting, quote, license to the scriptures, be, uh, that the scriptures be available in the vernacular tongue, Smith accuses them of being afraid of the light of scripture and being forced to do so by Protestants. Quote, Howbeit it seemed too much to Clement VIII, that there should be any license granted to have them in the vulgar tongue. And therefore he overruleth and frustrateth the grant of Pius IV. So much are they afraid of the light of Scripture, I'm going to skip the parentheses, 
that they will not trust the people with it. No, not as it is set forth, not as it is set forth by their own sworn men. No, not with license of their own bishops and inquisitors. Yea, so unwilling are they to communicate the scriptures to the people's understanding in any sort that they are not ashamed to confess that we force them to translate it into English against their wills. So in other words, the Catholic Church is brought to the table on the English Bible because they're forced to the table by the Protestants is essentially what Smith is saying. All right, now... Smith concludes the paragraph by accusing the Roman Catholic Church with possessing, quote, a bad conscience and dealing dishonestly with respect to divulging the scriptures in the mother tongue. This seemeth to argue a bad cause or a bad conscience or both. Sure we are that it is not he that hath good gold that is afraid to bring it to the touchstone, but he that hath the counterfeit. Neither is it true men that shunneth the light, but the malefactor, lest his deeds should be reproved. Neither is the plain dealing, neither is it the plain dealing merchant that is unwilling to have the weights or the meter yard brought in place, but he that useth deceit. But he will let them alone for this fault and return, but we will let them alone for this fault and return to the matter of translation. Okay? So it's pretty obvious what Smith is saying. So in these three subsections, in the next three subsections, excuse me, we will see Miles Smith address both the translator's adversaries and brethren who oppose the work. So in other words, are there some Protestants that were opposed to this? Yeah. Were there obviously Catholics who were opposed to this? Yeah. And so he is in the next three subsections going to address both Protestant opposition as well as Catholic opposition to what they have done in setting forth the scriptures afresh in the King James Version. Okay? Now here's my problem. The next, the next paragraph is like three pages long. So if I were to put it in here, we would never finish it with enough time. So now we're left here with like, you know, near that clock's slow. So nearly 10 minutes time to spare, which I guess isn't necessarily a problem. But in the next three subsections, we're going to be looking at what he has to say about both the adversaries and the brethren who oppose the work. So, like I just said, there were some Protestants who weren't necessarily thrilled that this happened. So he's going to address both categories in the next three subsections. Bart? Um, when it asks them to get a license and then prove themselves to not be frozen in the dregs, yet soured in leaven of their supers. What is that actually trying to say that they're... It's talking about that they had to appeal to the church authorities for a license. I understand that. What's that? And that their, their confessors, their inquisitors, the church authorities would evaluate them and decide if they were worthy or unworthy to possess the Bible in English. But it sounds like they got to prove that they're not worthy. They're frozen in the dregs and they're soured in the... That is, that is Smith's commentary about the church. Oh, okay. Not necessarily the state of these people that are examined by the Inquisition. Okay. It just seems weird. Yeah, so that weirdness, that, you're, that vagary there that you're talking about is one reason why I decided to give you both this modern spelling transcription and this modern edited form because I think this does sort of help get the big picture of what each subsection is about because there's stuff in here that is not easy to understand and this goes to the point we saw in a previous lesson about why none of the stuff is printed anymore in modern renditions of the King James so again I could go I've got an Oxford Bible here I go to the front of it and I don't have the preface I don't think any of you have it either okay Part of it is, it's like, unless you know and are dialed into the historical context of what's going on at this time, you're going you're gonna to read the preface and probably, and maybe be like, eh, I don't even know what he's talking about here. Now, that's certainly not everybody, but there's enough people that would be confused by that, I think, because we, you do have to go through this really slow. Okay, now, uh, any other questions or comments?
Yeah, I don't know. What is, when was it published? I don't know. I have it. I, bring it in I am going to bring it in. Yeah, bring it in. I, I, I can't really. That seems weird to me. Yeah, um, exactly what it says. I think I have a problem. The Roman Catholic Protestant Bible. <laughs> and like, whoa. And <laughs> your dad? My dad's mother, which was very a very good Christian woman, I think she gave that to my dad so that maybe that can... So this would be your grandmother. How long ago? Oh, we talked back in the 50s or 60s. Yeah, I would like to see it. I'll bring it in. Um, you know, it's we're talking... It's just a new topic. Okay. We're talking about all this, and I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but there's a re... There are many... Uh, I gotta be careful. There's a growing movement amongst Catholics to go back to the traditional Latin Mass. Oh, yeah. Well, wasn't it just in our... My, yeah, it was Vatican II. It was like, like, like the 1960s. Yeah, um, they used to be always in Latin. That, yeah, the Mass was always exclusively in Latin. But there's a re-traditionalization that's starting to happen, even amongst Catholics, to move back to the Catholic Mass. I think they're doing that um, because they don't want the people to find the truth. And because if people go back to Latin, they don't. They know they don't understand it. Most people. So everything. So find the truth. I would agree with you. I think the church has a vested interest in this. Mm -hmm. But from what I'm reading about this, it's the actual parishioners themselves who want the traditional mass and are seeking out parishes that are doing the mass in Latin um, because they. I don't know. They they like it better. They find it to be more religiously spiritual. I I don't, I don't know. There's 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 something going on there. But I, I'll be honest with you guys. I think there's a move worldwide right now in favor of more traditional authorities happening as the globalist world is under assault. And we're living in weird times. The times we live in right now are weird. Okay. Um, for a lot of reasons. And one of the things, even what Putin is doing in Russia, now, like, I don't, I say stuff about Putin and people think I'm a Putin guy, okay? People don't understand what Putin is doing. He is re-traditionalizing the Russian people under the umbrella of the Russian Orthodox Church. That he is re-traditionalizing Russian society as a bulwark against woke globalism. That's what he's doing. And so there's a there's a renaissance happening right now in Russia over the Eastern Orthodox Russian Church as people are going back to the traditional way. I'm starting to see the same thing happening amongst Catholics who are starting to give up the vernacular mass in favor of what? The Latin mass. It's a weird time we're living in right now. Okay? And I, I don't know where all of it's going or where it's all headed, but there's definitely trends Worldwide, towards a re-traditionalization, where people are, are are letting go of the one-size-fits-all world of Western globalism in favor of their more traditional mindsets and and, and, and uh, ways of thinking. Yeah. So, is this re-traditionalization getting to the most important thing, which is the blood atonement of Christ, or is it just just doing? What it is? <laughs> Great question. I unfortunately, I think it's just a religious thing um, I, I think it is more of a ethnic religious thing than it is necessarily a blood atonement true gospel thing to say it that way yeah. but I don't know it, I would say it's also very early in this I don't know where it's ultimately right. going to go but uh, I do think that there are some things happening worldwide that seem to suggest this um, kind of a thing but I, I, we'll, we'll see what happens. I don't know. I, so don't like say, Ross said this no, is going to no, happen. No, okay, no. I'm not a prophet. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. But it is interesting to look at some of this stuff. I think if you remember the screw tape letters, I think Satan uses a lot of things to distract and, and just That's what he's doing now. confuse people. Well, there's yeah. that Asbury Revival, right? That, I don't know if you guys have seen that. It's like, well, a true revival is like the crime rates drop. I mean, there's like a lot of things that happen with like a true revival. And you just, I don't know, you wonder if it's if it's authentic or not. 
Well, I have I have uh, intentionally not said anything publicly about Asbury just because there's enough people saying stuff about it. I, I'm skeptical. I'll, I'll be extremely honest. Like I, when there was when, you to look up the word, search the word revival in your Bible. Okay. When there was a true, first of all, I don't think you'll find the exact word revival. You'll find revived. You'll find various derivatives of revival. But I think about when King Josiah, when there was a true revival in Israel, it was because of a rediscovery of God's word. Not because of emotionalism and all this other stuff. And the thing about, the, the, the thing about, the other thing about the times that we live in now is God's word is literally everywhere. Everyone has it on their phone in their pocket. You can go anywhere you want to to have the Bible. God's word is everywhere. The problem in our day is no one's paying attention to it. They're not listening to it. Back in Tyndall's time, in the time of the translators, they were in a they were in a they were in a dogfight with Roman Catholicism to even put the scriptures into the English language. And that's why the that's why the church killed Tyndall because they didn't want it. Now Smith, as he's writing the preface, he's he's a, nearly a hundred years removed from from Tyndall, but he's well aware of the situation that existed at his time when it came to the views of people towards the English towards the vernacular of the vulgar tongues. Okay, now the Bible has been in the vulgar tongues. The, the Bible has been in the English tongue through the Reformation. The Bible has been in the vulgar tongues of, of people for nearly five hundred years. And the problem now is the adversary has gotten people to question what is the Bible? Is this version of the Bible? Is that version of the Bible? So people don't even really understand what the Bible is or there's, there's serious doubt about it. And the Bible's everywhere and he's gotten people to not even pay attention to it. So anyway, we, we do have to quit, but um, good questions. Next Sunday we'll continue with this and we'll look at uh, the next couple subsections where he's talking about dealing with his brethren and adversaries.